Hello everyone and welcome back to another art history lecture. I really wanted to start off today's video by thanking everyone for all the support I received on my most recent video on Korean textile art and pojagi. Because I think out of all the videos I've made so far, this one was the most personally fulfilling and most culturally invigorating and resonating for me to make. It was a topic that was just extremely personally sentimental to me and most culturally invigorating and resonating for me to make. So just for me to receive all those wonderful, lovely comments from such creative, wonderful people was genuinely very rewarding to receive and receive feedback from on something I do genuinely purely for fun. Something else a lot of people seem to notice in my comments was my lack of a proper microphone setup and a lot of people have been very politely complaining about the horrible audio quality of my impromptu Apple headphone microphone setup and I'm so sorry. <laughs> like I said, this is something I purely just do for fun and unfortunately I can't really afford a proper microphone setup as of now but as of now the headphones are gonna stay and i'm very very sorry about it today i am drinking a mix of a decaf peaches and ginger horny and sun's loose leaf brew a mix with some leftover morning blue people oolong tea it is a wonderfully sunny saturday today and what better beautiful berkeley afternoon could i have chosen to make a video on Berkeley alumni and artist Mene Okubo. I think I'm definitely starting to start this thread of choosing artists and art techniques that are just a lot more personally sentimental to my own personal identity because I feel like the passion and invigoration that I make for these specific videos just genuinely shows a lot more. And also, obviously, they are a lot more exciting for me to make. And a somewhat corny and embarrassing I do find people to put a huge great emphasis on the name of the school that people attend because in the grand scheme of things, it is pretty insignificant. I do find myself finding a great amount of pride whenever I hear about a female author or artist or creative. And I think rather than it being a pride in the name of the school itself, I think it's more so pride that I feel culturally connected to these women who have been able to make such a great legacy and name and identity for themselves in the grand scheme of history. So I guess to stumble upon this artist, Mene Okubo, who was a Japanese-American artist who attended Berkeley, was extremely rewarding and very personally exciting for me to research. As a Japanese-American artist, she is very well known for her representations of daily life and humanity, and she's actually most famous for her drawings depicting Japanese and Japanese-American internment during World War II. She was born on June 12, 1912, and actually grew up in Riverside, California, and both of her parents were from Japan and originally were born there, but soon immigrated to the United States in 1904 to represent their country in the St. Louis Exposition of Arts and Crafts in Missouri. Okubo's father was a scholar and her mother was actually a calligrapher, so she kind of had both feet already born and set in the world of arts. However, when both of her parents arrived to the U.S., the career and wage of an artist was something that was absolutely unsustainable and unlivable for her parents, especially as non-white immigrants. So initially, Okubo's father actually worked multiple jobs at a candy shop, as a gardener, and a landscaper. Her mother kind of transitioned into becoming a housewife and had very little time and very little financial capability to continue her own artwork, but always encouraged Okubo to pursue her own interest in art. For educational history, Okubo actually first attended Riverside Junior College in 1931 and then soon later gained a scholarship to study art at the University of California, Berkeley and graduated with a Bachelor of Arts in Arts in 1935. Okubo actually continued studying at Berkeley and 
pursued a master's of art in art and anthropology. Her excellence and eminent talent in the arts actually earned her the Distinguished Honor Scholar at Berkeley, as well as the Bertha Tossing Traveling Art Fellowship. And this award was given to her so she could actually study and travel and paint in Europe for two years while she was getting her degree. And during this time, she was actually able to be given the opportunity to live in Paris as she continued her school. After she came back to the US, she started dipping her toes in actual artwork and began working with Works Progress Administration's federal art project to work on a number of mural projects as well as from 1940 to 1941 working at the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art. However, on December 7th, 1941, the entire course of Manet Okubo's life as she knew it was absolutely turned upside down, as well as the lives of the entire Japanese American population in the US. When President Franklin Roosevelt issued Executive Order 9066 in 1942, which essentially banned people of all Japanese descent from living on the West Coast. Okubo and her family were forced to unfortunately vacate their home and were separated for relocation. Okubo and one of her brothers was sent to the Tanforan Relocation Center, which was actually a former racetrack in San Bruno, California. And there, this is where they shared a 20 foot by 9 foot horse stall that smelled of manure and were actually forced to sleep in this stall and designate it as their living space. Despite these absolutely awful, horrible living conditions that she was forced to live under, Okubo actually decided to continue to pursue her art and in conjunction with Berkeley art professor Chura Obata, who is also in the same internment camp with her at the time, and other fellow artists throughout the Japanese American community with her, Okubo within the internment camp actually helped to found the Tanfran Art School and later the Topaz Art School within the confines of the internment Japanese American community. Here, Okubo taught art lessons to children, adults, and senior citizens and worked as an illustrator for the Topaz Times. And here she also helped produce Trek, which was a literary magazine that was created at the Topaz Art School within the internment camp and here she was in charge of drawing the covers for magazines and acting as its kind of art director. In regards to her own artwork, Okubo, while she was in the internment camp, made over 2,000 drawings, these very light sketches in charcoal, watercolor, pen, and ink and they kind of all essentially depict her everyday experiences living in the camp. And mostly these drawings were of women and children in the camp. Since most of the more hostile and more openly violent parts of the camp were off limits for war relocation authority photographers and cameras, Okubo kind of took it upon herself to be and embody the camera and record keeper for these awful, awful events that were being imposed upon the Japanese Americans. And whether it was depicting children climbing into pails and pots and pans just to bathe or older senior citizens having to hold their nose because the poor sewage within the bathroom made it absolutely unbearable to even use the restroom. Okubo was kind of able to capture all of this camp life and all of its unpleasantness within her drawings. I think what caught my eye about these drawings and her visual details and portraying the Japanese Americans was her specified detail when she was drawing the bodies. Her very close-up portraits of the men and women and children and older senior citizens all reflect the physical diversity of the Japanese American community, which kind of subverts the racist stereotypes of Eastern Asian people all looking the same. Simultaneously, her sketches kind of accentuate the deep-lined faces of the internees that all kind of seem to share this sadness and deep worry and deep frustration and irritation of their condition of being detained. And the close-ups, if you notice, are mostly always positioned against a very distant background, teeming with a bunch of other unidentifiable bodies. And this depiction kind of makes it virtually impossible to forget the crowded, unbearable conditions of the camp that were built to house tens and thousands of Japanese Americans within one square mile. And as Foucault very importantly said in Space, Knowledge, and Power, quote, space is fundamental in any form of communal life. Space is fundamental in any exercise of power. In her sketches, she is very clearly able to embody this violation of the Japanese American human 
and the very correlation between the racially marked bodies and their natural human right to space. Space is essentially what played a huge central role in the construction and management of the Japanese Americans as a threat to national security during World War II. This lack of space is something that can be equated to the lack of freedom and the lack of human rights that the Japanese American prisoners had. Like, for instance, the fact that she had her designated living quarters as a literal horror stable. In 1944, during her time at the internment camp, Fortune magazine actually noticed Okubo's drawings in the Trek magazine that she helped start at the Topaz Art School and actually asked her to come to New York City to work as one of their illustrators. She agreed and upon this she was actually granted permission to leave the internment camp to take up residence in New York City to temporarily work for Fortune magazine. This is where she stayed even up until the ending of World War II and after the war officially ended, she was actually encouraged to compile all of these sketches that she had during her time as an internment camp prisoner into a book. It was in New York and her time at Fortune magazine where she actually completed her infamously known book, Citizen 13660. This was named for the number assigned to her family unit, which contained more than 200 pen and ink sketches. And this number is also referring to the number that was assigned to Okubo, when she was given three days to pick up all of her belongings and just simply relocate. And she wrote, quote, my family was reduced to number 13660. This numerical reduction as significantly quoted by Okubo kind of actually parallels a book I recently read in my Berkeley anthropology class. And I thought I would kind of squeeze this in there as tribute to her masters in anthropology at Berkeley as well. But the book is called Who Counts by Diane Nelson. and it kind of delves into and discusses the very manipulative power of numbers in the context of Western oppression. And her main thesis and her main investigation kind of delves into how Western mathematical practices and our current universal numerical system, often considered numerical even though technically it was created and based off the Mayan number system, are very deeply entwined with colonial histories and orchestration of social control. She critically examines the role for numerical systems during the Guatemalan Civil War where math was not just a tool for understanding, but also a mechanism for oppression, particularly in orchestrating the Mayan genocide. By distinctly separating the quantitative from the qualitative, there's kind of this objective to simplify and reduce entire identities, communities, and ethnicities as we can see with the Mayan genocide. Because when a Western power is throughout history is attempting to relocate a group of people, they don't see it as relocating a community or families or relocating an identity. They see it as relocating a number, like how many people do we need to transfer over here and how many people can we fit over here? It's a matter of numbers, it's not a matter of the qualitative, which is what truly should matter. This can even be seen after the context of World War II when the US government attempted to repatriate the Japanese American diaspora with financial packages and fiscal donations, which in a sense is kind of this twisted manipulative capitalist act of thinking an irreparable misdeed that was committed against an entire ethnicity could be simply repaired and forgotten with a generous donation in exchange of a quantified amount of money. And I really do think this book kind of underscores the importance of recognizing and resisting the very simplistic reduction of vibrant human lives to just mere data points or mere number. And with this, I think I can take an even greater appreciation on Okubo's choice to make an illustration book that is able to speak on the injustices that were served against her people that can be universally understood without a need for a literate or math education. And this book, Citizen 13660, and this book, Citizen 13660, was actually the first historically ever recorded account of the Japanese American prison experience from an actual internee. And all of her camp sketches, especially the ones where she kind of portrays herself in third person, she constructs herself as both a participant and an observer. Her kind of third person portrayal, like for instance in the one I'm gonna show, kind of shows this very unusually independent Japanese American female figure. 
But I think what's really interesting is she chose not to be extremely bitter or look upon this experience with an extreme resentment or bitterness because she also says, quote, I am a realist with a creative mind. I hope that things can be learned from this tragic episode for I believe it could happen again. Upon publishing the book, Okubo actually worked as a freelance and commercial artist until 1951 when she became a full-time painter. And she produced a huge, vast number of illustrations for newspapers and magazines, including Time, Life, and the New York Times. And she also occasionally provided imagery for children's illustration books as an illustrator. From 1951 to 1952, Okubo actually moved to California to work as an art lecturer at UC Berkeley before returning to New York. In 1981, kind of near the end of her career, the Commission on Wartime Relocation and Interment of Civilians was created to seek an apology and restitution for the injustices carried against the Japanese Americans in the World War II, and Okubo was actually chosen to appear and testify before this committee about her experiences and how her artwork connected to the internment. And with the help of this testimony, Congress actually passed the Civil Liberties Act of 1988 to recognize the illegal removal of people of Japanese ancestry in their homes during this time. Like I said, previously in relation to the Diane Nelson book, the internees were also rewarded financial compensation in the amount of $20,000. In 1984, nearly 50 years after its publication, Okubo's book, Citizen 13660, actually was awarded the American Book Award, a true sign of its universal staying power and presence. With its incredibly unique sensibility and historical insight, one can only hope Okubo's work will continue to live on to enlighten present and future generations on this tragic history and period in time in the American narrative that most people just wanted to forget. And I do believe a lot of her work is actually exhibited at the Japanese American National Museum in Los Angeles as of now. But surprisingly, when I was researching this artist, not too much was found about her on the internet, despite, like I said, being the first female Japanese American to publish the first ever historical record and account of the Japanese American experience within an internment camp. And I do think this is an absolutely incredible feat that I think personally should be recognized even more, but I guess, you know, that is the purpose of my channel. I think with this channel, not only do I hope to enlighten and inspire the people who watch it, but also to kind of commemorate the more lesser known and less frequently talked about artists that were marginalized during their time and were not recognized enough. And like I say at the end of every video, I hope you learned something from this, I hope it inspired you in some sort of way, and like I previously mentioned, I am so grateful <laughs> for all the wonderful and lovely comments that people leave behind. It really touches me, I read through every single one, and it's always so nice to see what the internet can do for us and bring digital communities together. So. Thank you so much for watching. Hopefully as my final spring semester kind of closes to an end and the summer starts, I'll be able to make a lot more videos because I do have a pretty heavy list of artists and art techniques that I want to talk about. So thank you so much for watching and I hope to see you in my next art history lecture. Bye!